Chapter 3 of The Air Lords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 We Sink the Ground Ships. Boss Handen of the Winslows, a giant of a man, a two fisted fighter, and a leader of great sagacity, had been selected by the council as our boss pro tem, and having given the scatter signal to the council, he retired to our general headquarters which we had established on Second Mountain, a few miles in the rear of the fighting front in a deep ravine. There, in quarters cut far below the surface, he would observe every detail of the battle on the wonderful system of viewplates our Ultrano engineers had constructed through a series of relays from ultrascope observation posts and individual cameramen. Two hours before dawn, our long-distance scopemen reported a squadron of ground ships leaving the enemy's disintegrator wall, and heading rapidly somewhat to the south of us, toward the site of the ancient city of Newark. The ultrascopes could detect no canopy operation. This in itself was not significant, for they were penetrating hills in their lines of vision, most of them which, of course, blurred their pictures to a slight extent. But by now we had a well-equipped electronoscope division with instruments nearly equal to those of the Hans themselves, and these could detect no evidence of disrays in operation. Handen appreciated our opportunity instantly, for no sooner had the import of the message on the boss's channel become clear than we heard his personal command snapped out over the long gunner's general channel. 970 long gunners on the south and west sides of the city, concealed in the dark fastnesses of the forests and hillsides, leaped to their guns, switched on their dial lights, and flipped the little lever combinations on their pieces that automatically registered them on the predetermined position of map section HM243839, setting their magazines for 20 shots and pressing their fire buttons. For what seemed an interminable instant, nothing happened. Then several miles to the southeast, an entire section of the country literally blew up in a fiery eruption that shot a mile into the air. The concussion when it reached me was terrific. The light was blinding. And our scopemen reported the instant annihilation of the squadron. What happened, of course, was this. The Hans knew nothing of our ability to see at night through our ultrascopes. Regarding itself as invisible in the darkness, and believing our instruments would pick up its location when its disrays went into operation, the squadron made the fatal error of not turning on its canopies. To say that consternation overwhelmed the Han High Command would be putting it mildly. Despite their use of code and other protective expedients, we picked up enough of their messages to know that the incident badly demoralized them. Their next attempt was made in daylight. I was aloft in my swooper at the time, hanging motionless about a mile up. Below, the ground ships looked like a number of oval lozenges gliding across a map, each surrounded by a circular halo of luminescence that was its disray canopy. They had nosed up over the spiny ridge of what once had been Jersey City, and were moving across the Meadowlands. There were twenty of them. Coming to the darker green that marked the forest on the map below me, they adopted a wedge formation, and playing their pencil rays ahead of them, they began to beam a path for themselves through the forest. In my ears sounded the ultraphone instructions of my executives to the long gunners in the forest and one by one I heard the girls report their rapid retirement with their guns and other inertron-lightened equipment. I located several of them with my scopes, with which I could, of course, focus through the leafy screen above them, and noted with satisfaction the unhurried speed of their movements. On plowed the Han wedge, while my girls separated before it and retired to the sides. With a rapidity much greater than that of the ships themselves, the beams penetrated deeper and deeper into the forest, playing continuously in the same direction, literally melting their way through, as a steam of hot water might melt its way through a snowbank. Then a curious thing happened. One of the ships near one wing of the wedge must have passed over unusually soft ground, or perhaps some irregularity in the control of its canopy generator caused it to dig deeper into the earth ahead of it, for it gave a sudden downward lurch, and on coming up out of it, swerved a bit to one side, its offense beam slicing full into the ship echelon to the left ahead of it. That ship, 
all but a few plates on one side, instantly vanished from sight. But the squadron could not stop. As soon as the ship stood still, its canopy ray playing continuously in one spot, the ground around it was annihilated to a continuously increasing depth. A couple of them had tried it, but within a space of seconds they had dug such deep holes around themselves that they had difficulty in climbing out. Their commanders, however, had the foresight to switch off their offense rays, and so damaged no more of their comrades. I switched in with my ultraphone on Boss Handon's channel, intending to report my observation, but found that one of our swooper scouts, who, like myself, was hanging above the Hans, was ahead of me. Moreover, he was reporting a suddenly developed idea that resulted in the untimely end of the Hans ground ship threat. These ships can't climb out of deep holes, boss, he was saying excitedly. Lay a big barrage against them. No, not on them. In front of them. Always in front of them. Pull it back as they come on, but churn hell out of the ground in front of them. Get the rocket men to make a penetrative time rocket. Shoot it into the ground in front of them, deep enough to be below their canopy ray, see, and detonate under them as they go over it. I heard Handon's roar of exultation as I switched off again, to order a barrage from my Wyoming girls. Then I threw my rocket motor to full speed and shot off a mile to one side and higher, for I knew that soon there would be a boiling eruption below. No smoke interfered with my view of it, for our atomic explosive was smokeless in its action. A line of blinding flashing fire appeared in front of the ground ship wedge. The ships plowed with calm determination toward it, but it withdrew before them, not steadily, but jerkily intermittent, so that the ground became a series of gigantic humps, ridges, and shell holes. Into these the Han ships wallowed, plunging ponderously, yet not daring to stop while their protective canopy rays played, not daring to shut off these active rays. One overturned. Our observers reported it. The result was a hail of rocket shells directly on the squadron. These could not penetrate the canopies of the other ships, but the one which had turned turtle was blown to fragments. The squadron attempted to change its course and dodge the barrier in front of it, but a new barrier of blazing detonations and churned earth appeared on its flanks. In a matter of minutes, it was ringed around, thanks to the skill of our fire control. One by one, the wallowing ships plunged into holes from which they could not extricate themselves. One by one, their canopy rays were shut off, or the ships somersaulted off the knolls on which they perched, as their canopies melted the ground away from around them. So one by one they were destroyed. Thus the second ground sortie of the Hans was annihilated. End of chapter 3